Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It's good to be with you for another edition of our program. Today, as always, we've got another exciting edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series brought to you by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality within the state of North Carolina and us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences within the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, also within the state of North Carolina. Uh, and today's special guests are also a part of those illustrious institutions within the state of North Carolina. We're going to get to them in just a moment. As always, though, uh, the Lunchtime Dis Discovery Series is an opportunity for us to meet some interesting people, hear about what's happening out there in North Carolina, in science and nature, art education, and more. Uh, and it's the opportunity to engage and ask questions. Remember that as we go throughout the program, as you have questions and thoughts that pop up for you about what you're hearing and learning about, drop them into the chat box there on YouTube. Um, I'll be looking to you, the viewers, for our questions a little bit later in the program. Uh, so make sure that you're doing that. Soon, we will have, very soon, uh, we will have the schedule set up for next month. Uh, February, of course, is Black History Month. So I hope that you'll all go ahead and mark your calendars, subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel, and click the bell to get notified, because every year we have an amazing suite of programs, and I don't want you to miss out on it. You can follow the Office of Environmental Education on Facebook and Twitter. They're at, EE, uh, at North Carolina EE, excuse me, and their website is eenorthcarolina.org. Uh, there you can see the schedule of events as they get posted and get updates. So I want to make sure that everybody has that information right now at the top of the program so that you can be aware of what's coming up in the future and stay engaged with this now very long-running and very awesome program. For today's talk for the Lunchtime Discovery Series, we're actually going to be meeting uh, two folks today, uh, folks that uh, many of you actually have participated in this program maybe for a little while now, probably heard from and met. First off, everybody... You're going to hear from Jerry Reynolds. Jerry is the head of outreach here with us at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Hey, Jerry. Hey, Chris. Thanks so much for having me back. Really appreciate appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I'm surprised they asked you, Jerry. You know, it's <laughs> I am too. <laughs> I heard you did such a great job. They thought never again. Never again. <laughs> I'm teasing. I tease. No, uh, Jerry's done. Actually, you've done several of these programs now, and you guest host from time to time. Uh, right. you, you might have, uh, you might have filled up your punch card. You might get like a free talk soon. Maybe so. I, I, I'm sure people are here for a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and then secondly, folks, you'll hear from Michael Fisk. Michael is the aquatic diversity biologist, excuse me, aquatic wildlife diversity coordinator. And I believe a biologist as well for North Carolina wildlife resources commission, Eastern region. Hi, Michael. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. We were talking before the show that uh, so many state job titles are just big word jumbles, and I managed to jumble it. That's all right. Everybody does. No big deal. <laughs> Appreciate that. Well, uh, I'm excited to hear a little bit about this least known fish, this uh, the lampreys, and Jerry, how you got to know them and what we do know about them. So I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you so much. And I'll... See if I can get my screen to share. Okay, hopefully the screen is shared, correct? It looks like somebody's backyard. This is my backyard, and, and that is where my story begins about my most favorite fish, actually. Uh, this is my backyard. Uh, I live in Johnson County, uh, just outside of Clayton. And uh, when we moved here in two, late 2003, uh, I was so glad to have a really nice patch of woods right behind my house because I am a nature lover. So I love the woods and everything about it. And of course, those woods have a small stream that uh, you know, drains the topography there. And uh, this stream actually uh, runs into Beddingfield Creek which drains Clemens Educational State Forest, and then Beddingfield drains into the Noose River. So just happy to have woods and a little stream 
right behind my house. Uh, this is a, a drone photo I took last year about this time when we actually had snow on the ground. And you can, uh, that's my house there. I'm sort of at, in the cul-de-sac. And you can probably make out, particularly with the snow on the ground, you can make out the little stream that actually uh, is behind my house. Uh, this is a little bit better view of uh, showing that stream. And that stream actually is my property line. So I, so the fenced in yard is mine. And you can actually probably see why we have it fenced in. You can see little, little dog tracks there. And uh, so I actually own the woods and I guess half of the stream there. And I'm, I'm right there uh, in that house there now. This is where I'm uh, broadcasting from, uh, from here in Johnson County uh, for this program. Anyway, uh, that little stream, uh, you know, nothing really remarkable except that it's a pretty nice, uh, fresh, uh, clean running stream. Uh, you can step over it in places. It doesn't really have, it's not big enough to have a name. Uh, and it, it's, it's pretty. Uh, this is this is a Johnson County waterfall, if you've never seen one of those. Uh, and this is when the water's not falling. Uh, so this stream is classified as an intermittent stream, which means that sometimes during dry, dry weather, uh, it's not running. And I've been here for almost 20 years, and I've seen it this way maybe five or six times. For the most part, there is water running through it, but it can dry up at, at times. Now, I've also seen it like this, where the stream is a raging river almost, uh, particularly after a uh, tropical storm when we get a lot of rain in a short time period. So, so this is a stream of extremes uh, in terms of what the animals have to live through at the stream. So uh, this is in a, the way I see it most of the time. And it was in uh, the spring of 2005 that I first encountered a fish that I hadn't ever seen before. My 12-year-old my son was out in the stream. We were checking it out. And he pointed at a long, skinny fish. Uh, and he said, Daddy, what's this? And from a distance, I looked at it and thought, well, that's just a freshwater eel, which I'm used to seeing. But when I dip netted it up, I knew it wasn't a freshwater eel. And actually, I had never seen this fish before. Uh, I knew it was lamprey looking. So I called uh, Wayne Starnes, who was curator of fishes at the museum at the time, and he knew exactly what it was. This is the least brook lamprey. And this is a wonderful photo by Scott Smith taken of a lamprey from my stream. So again, this is the first time I had encountered this species. And so it was in my backyard. So I was pretty excited about that and uh, you know, embarked on learning more about this fish. Now, lampreys have been around for a long time. Matter of fact, they're a member of a group of, of, of fishes called jawless fishes, which include lamprey and hagfish. And, you know, they... They first appear in the fossil record, you know, over 400 million years ago before the jawed fishes did. And actually during the Devonian, the age of fish, there are a lot of, of jawless fishes out there, most of which didn't make it much past the Devonian. But the hagfish and lamprey, wow, they whatever, whatever they're doing, they're doing it right because they are still with us today. Now, the least brook lamprey is a member of the family of uh, fishes called northern lampreys and probably the one fish that people know within this group is the sea lamprey. I mean these are big somewhat scary looking fish with those really scary looking mouth and of course these are parasitic on living fishes and and this is uh, not very pleasant to have one of those attached to you as they're rasping away <laughs> feeding on that fish. So a lot of people are familiar with the sea lamprey uh, the least brook lamprey is nowhere near that scary. Um, for one thing, they're much smaller. They're only about five or six inches long, uh, and they don't have those really scary mouth parts for feeding because actually in the adult form, the least brook lamprey does not feed. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So these are small uh, fish that, you know, they just sort of actually uh, they evade detection by most people. Now, they do occur primarily in the Mississippi drainage. 
Uh, this is the bulk of where their geographic range occurs, but we do have these Atlantic coastal plain populations. And based on some gen genetic work, matter of fact, uh, one of those lampreys that was that we that Chris, my son and I, Chris and I collected in uh, 2005 were, were part of a research study of looking at the DNA. And uh, Holly Martin, uh, based on the DNA, DNA work, she thinks that the uh, Atlantic coastal plain populations are probably a more recent event, maybe about two and a half million years ago. Uh, somehow they moved from the from the Mississippi drainage to the Atlantic coastal plain drainage, perhaps some geologic event caused a stream to be captured in the coastal plain drainage. So anyway, so there's some evidence that, that this is a fairly recent occurrence and then they spread from there. They're, they're, they're not common in the Atlantic coastal plain and that may be accounted for that they haven't really been here uh, for that long as relative to how long they've been in the Mississippi drainage. So anyway, sort of a cool, cool thing about uh, this species. Now, in North Carolina, uh, they occur only in the New Centaur River drainage system. And, and this is a, a map produced by the, the, the uh, fish staff at the museum here uh, showing uh, the, the distribution based on actual museum records. And then this is a little bit of a closer view here. And I think uh, this is, I guess, a couple years old now, so they may have more records than this now. But about 70-some records at, at this time with the first museum specimen uh, being collected in 1967 in Pitt County. Now, this is where I am right now. Uh, I live in Johnson County, but I'm really close to the uh, uh, Wake County line. Now, I mentioned that uh, they have a really interesting lifestyle. Now, when you see an adult lamprey, that's a, that's a fish that's maybe three to six years old. Uh, and they live, uh, the, the adult form is a very short lived part of their life. Most of their life, most of those three to six years uh, is in this form, which most people, if they found this, they might not even think it's a fish. Uh, this is the larval form of the Leesbrook lamprey, Amacetes form. Uh, and they don't have fins. Uh, they're really uh, sort of strange looking, actually. And a lot of people think, well, that's just a big worm or something. But they live in the stream in this way uh, as filter feeders in the stream bed, filter feeding the organic material out. Uh, and this is one that I, I never see these in the stream. Uh, this is one that actually I found this past summer dead uh, during one of those uh, infrequent drought periods that we have in which the stream actually dried up, left this muddy area. And when I walked back there, I was really surprised to see well, that looks like a lamprey there. But sure enough, it was. I'm surprised that some, some animal hadn't scavenged it already. Uh, so that gave me an opportunity to get this photograph of the lamprey. Now, this one was over five inches long. So this one probably would have transformed over the fall and winter to the adult form and would have been out there now as an adult if it hadn't died during that drought event. So again, most of their life, they're filter feeding in these streams. Uh, and then when they you know, grow enough, they will transform. The transformation actually begins in the fall and probably by winter, uh, they're a, a, a fully mature adult out there. And as an adult, they just have to hunker down and wait for the, sp the spring spawning season. Now, this is a close-up of the head, so they don't even have eyes uh, or well-developed eyes at this form, and those will come out later uh, as they transform to the adult form. So a really interesting lifestyle, how it, you know, is basically in the, in the, in the substrate, the, the muck and gravel filter feeding out of sight for us anyway, uh, for most of its life. Now, when they do come out, uh, in late winter, early spring, uh, something triggers the spawning activity. So they come out of hiding and then they become very active. And this is when most people can see them because they're, they're very visible uh, when they come out to do their spawning activity. And they're, they're, they're moving rocks around, they're 
making the sand move around. So it actually create a, uh, a gravel nest in this bed of the stream there uh, where they will uh, actually spawn. And this is about a, I don't know, three or four week period uh, based on my little stream from about mid-February to mid-March is when I actually observed the spawning activity. Now, uh, not many people know about this fish, and some of you may know Todd Pusser. He's actually a whale biologist, but he's also a well-known photographer and writer about uh, our wildlife, and he likes to pick subjects that are not well-known uh, and photograph them and write articles about them. So he spent some time a few years ago in my stream with his big camera uh, rig there uh, to actually photograph the Leesbrook lamprey in the stream and uh, got some wonderful photographs. He wrote a great article. This was actually a part of, I think, a three-part series of articles he wrote about a lot of our aquatic life. And this one was based was uh, focused on the uh, coastal plain diversity, which included photographs of of lampreys from my stream and and talked about them and about you know again some some of some of the hidden wildlife that we have again wonderful photographs and and this one he captures uh the moment of spawning and in spawning uh the female and i'll show you video in just a minute the, the female actually will attach to the rock with that sucker like mouth and uh then the male will come along and of course this happens very quickly the male comes along and attaches to the same rock or sometimes to the female's head. And then they uh, move very quickly. She's uh, releasing eggs. He's releasing sperm. Hopefully the eggs are getting fertilized and they drop down into the uh, gravel bed there. Well, they'll, you know, hopefully continue their development. Now, I don't have a big camera <laughs> like Todd Puster has. So I, I just, in fact, I don't really need one here because I, I just use a GoPro camera. Uh, this is this stream is very very shallow, you know, six inches you know, depth for the most part. So I can just stick a, a GoPro camera right in there and uh, photograph and film uh, the spawning activity of this really cool fish. Uh, you might see this is a GoPro Hero Three, so this is actually a fairly fairly old photograph. I need to get a new one in there. But anyway, uh, you know, you don't actually need a GoPro camera even. Uh, even to photograph those, uh, you know, again, the shallow water, if you get the light just right, uh, you can do this with a, with a smartphone, which is what I'm doing here. So this is showing a spawning group in this gravel nest that they've excavated by their activity of moving the rocks around and they're swimming. And so uh, again, during this, uh, I don't know, four week period, you can, if they're in your stream and spawning, uh, they're very visible and you can go out and uh, actually encourage people to look for them to help us map out their distribution. Now, let me turn my volume down. Sorry about that noise. But uh, this is, again, this is of the GoPro. And here you can see three that are working in a nest and uh, one will disappear. And uh, it's sort of hard to tell which one's the male and which one's the female. It'll be more obvious in, in just a minute. Uh, so they they moved the rocks around. It's, it seems random to us, but, you know, the, the net effect is that they create a depression by moving the rocks out, uh, fanning the sand out. And then and then at some point, the female will attach to that little rock there. And so, you know, that's the female now. And the male, well, he's, he's trying to move a bigger rock and maybe he's got to prove his worth. I, I don't know. But yeah, well, he, he moved it anyway. Uh, and now he'll actually go up and in this case, attached to that same rock. And there it is. And it's over. Of course, they'll do this repeatedly. But again, the the uh, the female is expressing the uh, the eggs and the male, the sperm. So hopefully those eggs will get fertilized and will drop down into that gravel bed. Now, here here's a bigger group. And again, I'll try to get the sound off just so you'll listen to, the, to that sound. But, you know, they get in these large groups. And I don't know who's who there, but <laughs> a, a, a combination of different different males and females are doing the, uh, the spawning activity. So, so not that I'm a least brook lamprey voyeur, but it's actually fun to fun to watch. I mean, they're very active. Uh, you don't have to be underwater to see them. Uh, so, uh, a very interesting thing uh, behavior to watch. 
then here's a, I think that's the same video. Here's, well, I think it's a different video. I get, so again, this is a little, another little view of them. And then they really stir up the sediment when they're doing this. So this is something that uh, uh, I enjoy going out to, to watch. Now, uh, for about the past eight years, I've, because I have them right behind my house, I've tried to do sort of a more of a, a little more of a systematic survey of them. I mean, it's nothing, uh, nothing real elaborate. I just simply, because I'm right, I'm right here by the stream, I try to go do a daily count during spawning season. And it's just a simple count where I walk the length of the stream and uh, count how many lampreys are spawning and how many nests are there. And uh, this is, again, that same photograph of the stream. And the section that I walk every day when I can is a, is a, a 550 feet long. I go from that little Johnson County waterfall to the end of my property line. And again, it's just a simple survey. And I do this for, again, every day that I can during roughly about four or five weeks. And the data that I generate is just pretty simple. And I actually, uh, you know, I have a count for every day and I use the highest daily count sort of as an index of the spawning activity in that little section of stream. And so I've been keeping up with it. And you can see in 2016, uh, it was the highest in which that one, one day uh, of that span of days, there were 43 individual lampreys spawning in that stream in different different nests. And so that's the highest count that I've seen thus far. The next year in 2017, there were only four. There were only four. Every day I went out there and the highest number I saw was four. You might remember that I mentioned that that stream is subject to extremes and going from drought to rushing water. Well, between those two spawning uh, periods, we had Hurricane Matthew and we had a lot of rain in that between those two spawning activity periods and that washed a lot of the stuff out of the stream and perhaps only a few survived that. So, so these lampreys, because they live in the stream in the larval form for several years, they have to be able to weather, you know, going from drought to, to stream water levels and, and these cycles, I'm sure, are normal. And again, this is this is just for my little section of stream. You, know, you go further down, it maybe show up as a little bit differently. But just because I can survey this, I, I like to keep up with uh, the activity in my stream. Now, I was worried about not just the stream drying up or the stream having too much water. I was worried about predators in a stream because during the spawning season, they're the lampreys are very visible and easy to see. So I was worried, well, how many of these are getting eaten by the predators? Uh, every stream around here is patrolled by raccoons. So I was a little bit worried about that. So I put trail cameras in the stream uh, to see what I could record. And, and uh, thus far, I've not seen any raccoons eating the lampreys, perhaps because the lampreys are mostly active with spawning during the day. Perhaps the raccoons miss those. But they're not missed by red-shouldered hawks. Red-shouldered hawks hunt during the day. They frequent that stream year-round. And during spawning season, they see them, and they actually jump. Well, they don't jump. They fly down and land in the water to grab the lamprey. So I have captured that with trail cameras. Uh, you can see a lamprey in the talon of that red-shouldered hawk right there. And this is a short little video here where one just jumped in, caught a lamprey, poor little lamprey became a meal uh, on that day. So they do prey on them. I don't know how much of an impact they have. Hopefully there are enough lampreys in the whole stream, stream uh, drainage way that, uh, that many of them evade being eaten by various predators. Now, towards the end of the spawning season, it, it usually ends up where I'm just watching the same lamprey. I go out every day and there's just one lamprey left. Uh, they have a, 
they have a pretty good fidelity to the nest depression, so they often will be still in that same nest. Uh, but the adult lamprey doesn't feed, so is it spawns and then dies unless it is eaten by something else. Now it may seem a little bit sad, but don't be too sad because this is this is their way, this is their natural life. Uh, and it has worked for them for many millions of years. So, so I, I, I'm a little sad to see the last lamprey, and then the next time I go out there, it is probably going to be gone. Now, I do worry about my backyard a little bit. I do worry about the streams that, that go through there and streams everywhere uh, because, you know, it'd be pretty easy to uh, have something happen to that little stream. The woods behind the house, you know, could be developed. And I haven't lost sight that I'm in a development <laughs> that impacted that stream. But uh, it seems to have survived this residential development. But but it does worry me that, uh, you know, the aquatic diversity that we have that depends on these small streams is at risk. And in Johnson County, we are one of the fastest growing counties in North Carolina. And with that comes big development. Like this is a fairly recent project, not very far from me. That's I think uh, between four and five hundred acres. And again, this big chunk of woods here is no longer there. And this is actually fairly close to Clemens Educational State Forest. So this development worries me in terms of the impact that it can have on yeah, you know, well, on the animals of the forest, but also on our aquatic diversity. Uh, that does occur in those streams, both small and large. So I do worry about that. Now, Michael Fisk, who is going to be talking just in just a minute, uh, he is paid to worry about that <laughs> because in his position, you know, aquatic diversity is his job in terms of uh, monitoring it, researching it, and also perhaps uh, coming up with uh, a plan for how do we protect that aquatic diversity. So he's going to, uh, I'm wrapping up here, and uh, he's got some uh, shocking discoveries for you in his part of the presentation. And so with that, I am going to stop sharing. I gave you a little bit of background about this, about this really cool fish, and he's got a lot more information based on some of his recent work. So let me stop sharing and with that, I'll turn it over to Michael. All right, appreciate it, Jerry. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, uh, like Jerry said, I work with uh, the in the Aquatic Wildlife Diversity Group, and um, you know, you know, lampreys is just one of uh, many species we work with. We cover all the non-game fish mussels and crayfish and snails throughout the state so um lots of lots of animals to work with but uh, as as jerry alluded to the leashbrook lamprey is really um kind of uh, has gone under the radar for quite some time in north carolina uh, there's really never been any targeted surveys for them we know they're in the noose in the tar basin but um outside of just kind of some anecdotal collections we don't have a lot of information on their distribution and there's still a lot of questions about their life history so um, kind of picking up where jerry left off you know we wanted to do something uh kind of start ramping up and start chipping away at that and start filling in some of those knowledge gaps and just looking at distribution spawning and timing and, and the habitats they're using so so we can really you know, get to a point where we can describe the population and um be able to make you know meaningful uh, conservation decisions based on that. Okay, let's see. All right, so in 2021, we decided to start with the Noose Basin um, and went out and scouted a bunch of sites, and mainly around historical collections, but also some new places, and really just looking for a good physical habitat. You know, areas that uh, the the lampreys would uh looks like they would be able to use for spawning and we went out and visited those during that spawning window uh jerry was talking about and our goal and what we did was uh 
you know, whenever we came across a lamprey or came across the nest that we found, we would get GPS coordinates there. Um, and then we would attempt to collect the, to catch the lamprey. They are, um, they're fairly easy to catch. You could see Jerry's photos. He was right up next to them really close. And so they're, they're kind of have a one track mind and are, and are um, not easily disturbed. So you can kind of sneak up behind them and catch them with a dip net pretty easily. Um, and once we collected them, you know, we were getting just basic information off of them, looking at their, their total lengths, seeing if they were male or female, um, collecting fin clips for genetic analysis down the road, and then also just kind of recording their behavior. Are they just kind of hanging around staging? Are they excavating nests or actively spawning? Um, that kind of thing. And then also collecting uh, habitat information, the measuring the habitat they're in, the substrate, um, the flow conditions, um, just all to be able to kind of describe what they're doing. So here's just a few pictures of uh, us in action. The, the top left from there is our, our Eastern biologist, Mike Walter. Uh, he's working up some lampreys. So when we collect them out of the stream, we just keep them in a five gallon bucket right there and work them up and then release them back right where we found them. Um, Lampreys are extremely wiggly and do not cooperate very well when you're holding them in your hand trying to get a length on them. So we kind of created this funny little contraption in the middle picture here so we could slide them in this uh, plastic tube and keep them straight long enough to be able to get a total length on them. And then um, um, Sierra Benfield, our other biologist, uh, she's she's taken a fin clip off of a, a collected matum that are collected uh, lamprey. So, um, so yeah, just some of the things that how we have to work them up and, um, you know, everything's done right there on the edge of the creek. <clears throat> and so just to orient everybody <clears throat> in 2021, we're in the new space in here, which is highlighted. And this is kind of just close up, zoomed in. Um, Jerry, this is marking where Jerry, the red dot there, red arrows marking where Jerry's surveys were. Um, the, the gray up in the top left corner is Raleigh. So there's Crabtree Creek watershed and these smaller kind of uh, polygons, black polygons are just smaller watersheds in the um, upper Noose uh, Basin. And so you can see the, the historical collections there, the black dots, and that's where we did all of our, um, our scouting around those. And we came up with um, you know, 75 unique sites. And out of those, we did 91 surveys in 2021. Um, most of those surveys are in and around these historical collections, but some were outside of it. Um, like up in Contentnia Creek in the top right there, we did, uh, there was really good habitat, but there had never been any lamprey found there, but we still surveyed there as well. Um, and even worked with the state park uh, folks up in Umstead State Park and uh, up in the Crabtree Creek watershed looking for lampreys up there. And so uh, we surveyed from March 1st to March 15th during that that spawning period of time when uh, the water temperatures were ideal for them to spawn. And we found some lampreys. Um, you know, most of our collections were kind of in and around these historical spots, but we did uh, find places where they had not been documented before. Um, and the, the hot spot for us in 2021 was in the Middle Creek watershed where we found lampreys in Buffalo Branch, which is a main tributary to it and two unnamed tributaries uh, that flow into Middle Creek. So a lot of spawning activity in there. Um, we also found them kind of in and around where uh, Jerry's observations were and uh, detected them in the Marks Creek watershed, which is kind of just above here of Jerry's. Uh, they'd never been detected there. Um, for the Little River watershed, they had been found in the upper end of it, and we found them down below in kind of the middle part of the river. So, um, again, you're finding areas that, you know, they're still persisting and finding new populations of them as well. <clears throat> so then just, just kind of summarizing that, you know, we found 51 Leesbrook lamprey at 11 different sites. And I wanted to share this picture on the right here. This is a 
a female leech broke lamprey kind of flipped upside down and you can see you can actually see through the skin the eggs that are kind of she's a really gravid female um and so you can see the eggs it almost looks like a, a corn cob almost but um so uh she's ready to spawn and um it was really interesting to be able to get that kind of observational data from them so then moving to the to 2022, we focused our efforts more in the tar basin. <clears throat> and again, here's some historical collections of them. You know, the smaller uh, inset map down here kind of shows where we were. Um, but most of the collections have been from Fishing Creek and Little Fishing Creek and then Lower Swift Creek. And we ended up scouting out and then uh, surveying um doing 60 surveys at 51 different sites from February 21st to March 7th. And out of those, um, didn't have as much luck as we did in the noose, but we did find uh, lampreys in Little Shaco Creek watershed over here. Um, we found them in Ben's Creek in the upper Little Fishing Creek watershed, and then in a new, new watershed of... Um, uh, Bear Swamp, which flows into Medoc Mountain State Park. So that was a really good find. <clears throat> we also found, um, so the area up here is like the Roanoke Basin. And uh, we also found American Brook Lamprey up here during the spawning period. Um, this was, these efforts were all kind of from a video that was sent in to Fritz Rohde, which uh, works for um, NOAA. He's a longtime North Carolina fisher uh, ichthyologist and uh, done a lot of work with lampreys on the East Coast. And uh, a video was sent in that showed uh, lamprey spawning in this little creek in the Quanky Creek water, watershed. And so we went out there in 2022 and uh, uh, were able to document uh, American Brook lamprey. And uh, which is this is really cool because this is the first documentation of American Brook lamprey. Um, really in the Atlantic Slope in North Carolina. Um, they've been found in the Roanoke Basin in Virginia, and the only other record of them in North Carolina is way out west um, in Madison County in the French Broad Basin. So this was a really neat find uh, to get, pick up another species on uh, in our region. And here's just a little bit of information on the American book lamprey. Um, very similar life history. They spawn, uh, the water temperatures are a little bit cooler. They spawn a little bit earlier, but there's quite a bit of overlap with leash brook lamprey. They get a little bit bigger, but again, they are um, non-parasitic. And, um, you know, you can walk along and spawn in, in similar habitats. We found 17 of those and... Um, you see in the picture here, this one, they, they don't lay down and uh, play that nice when you're trying to take a picture of them. We actually found this one. It had washed up on a, on a sandbar, kind of a little, little bit downstream. So as Jerry was saying, once they spawn, it, they, they die soon afterwards. So this one had already spawned and it had finished up and um, we, were able to, we were able to find it. So for, for our 2022, you know, spawning surveys, we ended up finding 47 lamprey, leashbrook brook lamprey in the tar basin at three unique sites. Um, <clears throat> in the new space, and we actually did a little bit more work down there in some of the areas that uh, we had found them in 2021 and collected 50 at four unique sites, and then also picked up the American brook lamprey in the Roanoke basin, so still a lot, of, uh, a lot of useful information from those two spawning seasons. And then just looking at kind of the lot, the, those two years combined, the things that we found, um, we found you know, 148 leash brook lamprey between those two basins and the American brook lamprey. The, um, the size distribution of them, the females average just a little bit bigger than the males, although both of them are, are still really small and both are you know, have a lot of us uh, size overlap um, the females were you know 127 millimeters you know around five inches and the males were just a little bit less than that at 4.8 inches and then the 
picture here shows that some of the data we collected, you know, we were able to go along and find, um, you know, big spawning aggregations. Um, and this, this tributary Middle Creek, we were able to find five nests um, that, that multiple groups of lamprey were working in and uh, we're able to document that. So we also, from the, the aggregate spawning aggregations we found, you know, we got, we saw, you know, anywhere from just two individuals spawning in the nest up to 12 lampreys at a time. Um, got a lot of good behavioral data from that. The, um, you know, not all of the lampreys, you know, all 12 or all six or however many it is in the nest, they're not all spawning at exact, exactly the same time. You know, there's half of them are end up like moving pebbles and rocks out the way and kind of excavating and then like smaller groups end up spawning. So um, it's kind of a longer process and just they're all kind of mixed together there. And so along with our, our spawning surveys, we also um, wanted to look at the juvenile lamprey. You know, our, our spawning surveys are really only dealing with the adults. And so we wanted to learn more about um, that juvenile life stage. You know, I, I often consider, you know, think about leafbrook lampreys. They, they're kind of like the cicadas of the water. You know, they, they're down in the substrate. You never see them, you know, and they pop up for just a little bit and then they're gone. Um, and so part of the reason why they're so hard um, to document and find is because you know, traditional, like standard, uh, fisheries techniques like backpack electrofishing, you know, don't work for lamprey. Um, you know, since they're down in the substrate and someone goes through and does some backpack electrofishing, <coughs> excuse me, that will shock and stun all the other fish species. The lampreys are immobilized down in the substrate, but you never see them. Um, lampreys have um, like a a couple other different species of fish have electroreceptors and are really sensitive to electricity. Um, and so by using really low frequency, really low voltage, we're able to use our backpack electrofishers and, um, you know, energize the water and it doesn't shock the lampreys, but they come up out of the substrate and just start swimming around. They're never immobilized. And so once they come up, we're able to chase them down and, um, you know, be able to collect information off of them there. And so in November and December of last year, we ended up going out to these three sites here circled and uh, just, just kind of trying all this out. And we got some pretty good data. Um, you know, this graph here shows the size distribution of the lamprey that we found. Um, we had in, there's Pearl Creek, which is in Southeast uh, Wake County. And then Clemens State Forest, that's Beddingfield Creek and tributaries. And then also we went over to Jerry's and electrofished as well. <clears throat> and you can see these, these like 25 to 30 millimeter lampreys. Those are the young of the year. So those were born, you know, in February, March of that year. Um, then from 30 to 90 millimeters, you've got at least two, maybe three different age cohorts there. Um, and then from 90 millimeters up to 130, we have uh, we know from our our spawning surveys that the transformed adults can be anywhere from like 95 up to 140 millimeters. So the vast majority of the ones we collected were still juveniles, but we did get a handful of adults that had already transformed in November. Um, so there's probably multiple age classes here as well. So Looking at the size distribution here, we need more data, but there's there's likely, you know, four, four, five, six different age classes here, which is, is really interesting to see. Um, and also kind of uh, complements, you know, what Jerry saw in his spawning surveys in that, you know, down here, these these young of the year individuals, the smallest of the small, Jerry saw very little spawning activity in his creeks uh, last February and March. And kind of shows up in this data here and that we didn't collect any any young of the year in his creek so um, we're able to use this data here and kind of make emphasis on what you know what's going on in the creeks and is there like recent recruitment and so that's really useful information for us moving forward 
And so here's just a picture after I, back, I collect your fishing. <clears throat> and um, just a, a bowl of spaghetti, basically. Um, yeah, we, we end up, you know, we don't keep all of these in a, in a, in the container at once. We work up through a couple of them at a time and get links off of them and uh, kind of work through them and then and put them back into the creeks. And Jerry talked about this a little bit, but I um, thought I would share it again. Um, you know, just kind of the differences between the juveniles and the adults. The juveniles don't have any eyes. They don't have fins. And uh, their mouth is that real hooded shape here in this picture in the lower left, really made to funnel in water and filter out microbotrytis and, and other, um, other things they're eating. The adults, once they transform, they do have these developed eyes and fins and their mouth like uh, is that more disc shaped, you know, in the picture here in the lower right. Um, another thing to point out here is that, you know, both both life stages have the, the, the pineal eye um, and that's kind of a primitive eye that it, um, some vertebrates have. It's a photoreceptive and helps to regulate the uh, circadian rhythm with um, uh, in whatever in, in those individuals. So, and then, I think it's kind of neat too. There's the, the pineal eye and then right in front of that is the nostril. So that way they're able to attach to uh, a rock or something and pull it and they can still breathe. They don't have to let go and start gilling. So it's kind of neat to see their nostrils like up there on, on top of their head. <clears throat> so out of the last couple of years, we've gotten a lot of good information about just the current distribution. Um, you know, the, the biggest question we have is that, you know, this, you know, lampreys in general, are very cryptic the way because of their lifestyle. And what we need to know is that are they cryptic? Um, are they cryptic and common? So they just we just don't see very many of them. Or are they cryptic and rare? Um, which if that's the case, then that means that we need to take higher conservation measures um, and uh, play a larger role in, uh, in just management of the species. So we're still trying to answer that question. Um, still working on, you know, we were able to get to both of these basins in the last couple of years, but still have a ton of areas to cover. Um, and then also we have a, a lot of useful information that I really didn't go into today, just describing spawning habitat uh, with the, you know, the substrate flow and the nest descriptions. And this is really important information uh, to develop habitat suitability models. And those, uh, those play a, a large role in, in um, you know, modeling impacts to watersheds, whether it be from urban development, whether it be from climate change. So um, these will be important moving forward as well. And moving forward, we're going to keep chipping away at, at uh, Leashbrook Lamprey. Um, we we'll continue our backpack electrofishing surveys in the tar and the noose. Uh, most of our work's been done in the Piedmont, but we're going to uh, venture down into the coastal plain, check out some of the historical locations down there. We'll probably cut back on uh, <coughs> excuse me, our spawning surveys, not do as many instead of doing kind of a shotgun approach like we've done the last couple of years, maybe pick a few spots and be more concentrated and spend more time at those, those areas. And um, we're also continuing to collect more uh, fin clips. So we've got you know, roughly 60 right now. Um, and we'd like to get to a point where we can uh, to be able to describe the genetic diversity of you know, the new space in the tar basin and smaller watersheds and be able to compare among those and see and see what it is. So, um, and then, you know, I mentioned talking about the, um, just the size distribution and looking at the different age classes. Um, we're interested in tagging some of those really small juveniles and following those through time to see exactly how old they are when they transform. Um, and that kind of age information is really important uh, uh, for us to know, like how, how long they'll be in a system at any given point. So, and you know, the fact uh, that lampreys in general just haven't got a lot of attention 
in North Carolina. We're, you know, we'd like to expand it to other species that are in our region. You know, now that we have American Brook lamprey, we're going to be doing similar stuff in the Roanoke Basin. And then we also have sea lamprey in uh, coastal North Carolina. This is uh, North Carolina is the southern range for sea lamprey, where they migrate from the ocean and spawn. And then um, the juveniles are here and, and spend several years here before they migrate out into the ocean. And so we don't know a whole lot about them. So we're going to start working with those as well. Um, and then I think um, just in general, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's a kind of a neat outreach component to lampreys and just the fact that you can kind of walk down in your backyard seeing lampreys. You know, I've taken my kids out several times and they like going out and just looking for them. And I think there's a really neat opportunity to have some type of you know citizen science project to where folks can be looking for lampreys in their backyards, in the streams that are close by and be able to help contribute to, you know, where they are and, uh, um, you know, kind of help kind of build this data set moving forward. So, <clears throat> so with that, um, you know, just like to acknowledge, you know, Fritz Rohde and Bryn Tracy have been extremely helpful just uh, in field collections and just with lamprey uh, being, being a resource for lampreys and, and knowledge there. Um, and then Clemens State Forest and Raleigh Parks and Recreation for letting us get out on their um, properties um, kind of after hours, I guess you'd say. So um, that's all I have. So I'd be happy to take some questions. Michael, Jerry, thanks a lot. Very interesting stuff. It's uh, it's exciting to see some of the work that you've got going on. Uh, but exciting to see that these fishes haven't been getting much attention and that now, Michael, you're able to actually put some resources into it and learn more about them. Yeah, they've just really kind of flown under the radar for quite some time. Um, and so, yeah, just just getting really basic life history information and distribution, you know, nothing, nothing fancy, just kind of learning a little bit about the species kind of help us help us manage them better. That's exciting <laughs> stuff. It's uh, the, the edge of science. Yep. And I was going to add that, you know, since I discovered in my backyard, I, I sort of felt like the uh, the Lone Ranger you know, trying to encourage people to get out and look for lamprey. And now I feel that the cavalry has arrived. Michael and team <laughs> are here. So I'm so glad to, to see that they're able to put some resources to really doing a lot more research than, than I can just do in my little backyard. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> I know I'm kind of curious, like it, if it's if I should get out and go find, you know, does the little drainage that's, you know, in my neighborhood have these have lamprey in it? You know, it doesn't look like much. But I don't know, maybe that's where the lampreys like to hang out, too. And that, that's exactly why I've spent so much time showing how small my little stream was that. Yes, you should look. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't take much. Just um, seems like you, we see them in really small streams. Um, just one thing kind of to watch for, you know, if it's drying up in the summer, like every year, you know, um, you know, maybe maybe there's less likely a chance of them to be in there. But if it's holding water for most of the year, you know, then you've probably got a decent chance of it. OK, All right. I'm, I might have to go scouting a little bit. I'm not I've done a little bit. I've not seen fish at all, so it probably dries up. But uh, that's enough about the drain in my backyard. Uh, I want to get to some viewer questions. First one that came up for us, uh, what is the difference in the orange and pink parts of the range map that you had shared, Jerry? Uh, that range map was from iNaturalist, and I think that it was a combination of of, of data sets one just sort of the the supposed geographic range of the species and then i think the other colors particularly if i remember right the red colors were showing actual verifiable observations in our naturalist uh, so i think it's just a combination of the different data uh, as it was presented by our naturalist and of course our naturalist maybe does not include 
all the observed records of specimens that all museums have. And I think the I think the the broader color pattern probably did pull some of that data. Okay. All right. Uh, how do you know for sure if they're the same individual? Jerry, you were saying you go out and you see the the same lamprey in the same depression every day. Are you sure? Do they have any unique identifiable spots or markings? Well, actually, because I'm out there every day, that I mean, a lot that I, I can't identify, but some have scars on them. Even some have a little bit of a different color, shade of color, like like almost a pale, very pale looking one. So I have seen some individual differences of uh, that allow me to at least follow a few of the individuals over several weeks. And, and when it comes down to like the last lamprey hanging out in that depression, uh, I mean, sometimes that, that lamprey is there for uh, a week or more before either it just dies and floats away or something comes along and eats it. So I can't identify all the individuals, but some, but some I can. If you spend enough time looking at them, then you can you can you can uh, pick up on some characteristics that will allow you to identify. Otherwise, you're right; they all they sort of all look alike. <laughs> <laughs> Although there was another great question, uh, Michael, when you were sharing a lot of the photos too, a lot of the lampreys seem to have different colorations, darker ones and lighter ones. And so Ed was curious if those were different kinds are they different ages maybe um there is you know a little bit of variation individual variation when you pick them up but um they're they could be different ages you know all of their when they transform it's all about how much resources they've gotten throughout their life to make them big and mature um so some individuals you know if they are allotted you know lots of nutrients, lots of really good growing conditions, they could mature earlier. Whereas other individuals, if they're kind of small or stunted, it may take them, you know, a couple of years uh, longer than that to, to mature and transform. So um, there's probably the transform adults are probably you know, anywhere from three, four, six years old and maybe, maybe long, older. Okay. There you go. Uh, Michael, did you see any interesting trends in sex ratio throughout the season? The majority of what we found were males. So I think it was, um, I'd say probably there were three males for every female, three to one ratio. Um, okay. Definitely a lot less males. And it seems like, as, as Jerry kind of alluded to, there was always individuals that seemed like they showed up early and individuals that stayed late, and those are more than likely males. That's kind of typical for other fish species. The males show up first and uh, hang around the whole time and linger, and then the females just get there, do the business, and are out of there. <laughs> Good question. Glenn wants to know if there's enough information to know if populations are declining, stable, or increasing. Um. I, I don't think we can answer that question yet. Um, you, you can see, you know, the distribution map that we showed in, especially in the news, you know, they're in Wake County and Johnston County. And like Jerry was saying, just there's so much, uh, you know, instance of development and you know, interaction in those watersheds and change that uh, there's definitely some places that, that uh, could be impacted. Um, if some of the areas that we saw uh, that we went and visited historical collections, the habitat should change completely and not just from development, but really, you know, we would go to a spot and there would be a huge uh, beaver pond there, an established beaver pond that's been there for, you know, 20 years. And the collection of the lamprey was, you know, maybe 40 years ago. So um, things change and, what we were happy to see is that even though a spot like that had been modified and it was no longer suitable for lampreys, you know, maybe a nearby Creek still had lampreys and we were finding them there. So they were still in the same general area. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. We had, uh, we had a question come in on Twitter with the hashtag lunchtime discovery from Emmy 
who actually shared some images because they want to know if these eggs are lamprey eggs. They found them at the creek at the museum's Prairie Ridge Eco Station on January 10th. Uh, let me see if y'all can see these. So these just came in. Uh, any clues? Could these be lamprey? They look big. Yeah, yeah. I, I would suspect uh, perhaps two line salamander. They 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 tend to lay eggs underneath rocks like that. That would be my guess. Yeah, the the lamprey they are depositing their eggs into the sand and gravel in their nests, so they wouldn't be they wouldn't be attached to a big flat rock like that. And those are those are much too big to be lamprey eggs. Really, really cool, cool, yeah. cool that you found them. <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome discovery. Maybe somebody else can jump in the chat and maybe positively identify them for us if they if they think they know. But uh, amphibian. Salamander I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain two line salamander. Almost certain. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're running out of time here. There's just a few more here. Um, describe, can you describe the stream types where they're found? Are they all shallow and gravelly? They're not, they're not all shallow and gravelly. Um, we, we do have collect records of them in the Little River in Johnston County, where it's, you know, it's a decent sized river and kind of deeper and really hard for us to go out and observe spawning in those types of habitats. Um, you see, there's a, there's several collections from the, the Middle Creek um, that same deal. They're bigger water, much deeper and um you know, not always these really small, shallow streams where you can see the bottom. Okay, so actually diversity of habitat types then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so the other things in the chat I'll bring up, there's some folks who say they've got property out with some maybe good lamprey habitat. Can they get in touch if uh, they want you to come sample or maybe you can work it into your next field season? Um, absolutely. Um, you know, my contact information was at the end of the presentation. So please, um, you can email or call me and uh, be happy to look into it. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, so we're over time now. I appreciate you staying a couple of minutes late for us. And there's even more questions coming in. So, uh, Jerry, Michael, I think we'll have to have you back in the near future to chat lampreys again. Sounds That's good. Good. Glad to. And, uh, you know, I'll look forward to your uh, hearing about your surveys, which must be coming up soon, Jerry. That's right. I'll, I'll be I usually start looking for them uh, February 1st. Yeah, you know, I want to make sure that I capture the first observable appearance of the adults. So I'll be out there every every day that I can getting February 1st. <clears throat> Perfect stuff. Thanks to you both. Uh, thanks to all of our viewers. Sorry that we couldn't get to all your questions today, but. There will be more lunchtime discovery series opportunities, uh, and you can probably get in touch with us. I'm sure that the head of outreach at the museum will be happy to continue to answer questions about fish, uh, and we can share those with Michael, too, to make sure we get all the right answers. So thanks to the both of you. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll be back here again next Wednesday with another great program. I'll remind everybody that this weekend at the museum in downtown Raleigh, is our two-day festival, Astronomy Days. Lots of great stuff going to be happening here, including presentations with NASA astronaut Christina Cook. So don't miss out on a great festival. Two days, all things space and astrophysics here in downtown Raleigh at the museum. Also, I'll mention that the Museum of History, right across the plaza from us, this weekend is hosting the African-American Cultural Celebration. So there's a lot of great reasons to come down and visit us here in downtown Raleigh and take advantage of even more of the great resources available to you from the state of North Carolina. Until next time, everybody, uh, take care, stay safe out there. Maybe jump out there soon and look for lampreys if you can. And <laughs> We'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody. <laughs>